$100. That's all that stands between you and gaming. If you've got it, I've got you. Come on. Right off the bat, we need to establish a few things. Let me tell you what this PC is not. It is not a high-end gaming rig or some secret FPS monster, but it has one trick up its sleeve, AM4. At this price point, it's a luxury to be able to buy a system that can game today and have a very healthy upgrade path. A particularly nice path because this ASRock Fatality board can be upgraded to Ryzen 5000 allowing a compatibility with one of the best gaming CPUs in the world. Historically, at this price point, we would have a CPU that predates Katy Perry's roar. Speaking of CPU, we have the Ryzen 5 2400GE, a 4-core, 8-thread CPU that many gamers will remember fondly from the GPU apocalypse. It was a perfect placeholder to get you gaming till prices returned to normal. They would return to normal, right? Right? For our GPU, we have the Ryzen 5 2400GE, a 4-core 8 th Wait, I just read this. Yeah, but seriously, this is where our compromise lay. Instead of the performance a GT710 or 1030 may offer now, we traded that for an upgrade path. But I still think it's worth it. The few extra frames today that the GT710 may offer will hurt you when you go to upgrade and you will need a whole other platform again. To maximize our Vega 11's performance, we allocated two gigabytes of our system RAM to VRAM in the BIOS. For the rest of our components, we have a 12 gigabyte kit of mismatched DDR4, an unassuming small form factor case with a no-name flex 300 watt power supply. It is, however, a nice touch to have an NVMe SSD at this price point, even if it is SATA. For all of this, I paid $107.99, including shipping. For reference, the cheapest AM4 ITX motherboard that I could find on eBay right now is over $100. In fact, the cheapest AM4 motherboard, regardless of size, was over $55. Now look, I know we could build a better PC if we utilize Facebook Marketplace. I recently grabbed an i7-12700K and 3070 system for $360, but I wanted to put together something that is repeatable and comes with buyer protections. In case you didn't know, if a seller marks a listing as used condition on eBay, it must be in fully functioning condition regardless of what their description says. I have returned several items to unscrupulous sellers that resulted in a full refund. Starting off our benchmarks, I was very pleasantly surprised. I knew Valorant was easy to run, but I didn't know it was this easy. 1080p lowest settings, we averaged 93 FPS with 50 FPS for our 1% lows and 4 as the 0.1%. The 0.1% lows I found were not representative of the overall experience. It was genuinely very smooth and as it was my first time playing Valorant, had me wanting to play even more. I found the 0.1% lows were mostly a result of having the spike explode and kill you. If Valorant was surprisingly smooth, Minecraft was surprisingly ass. Despite pretty good overall frame rates, any time the game had to render another chunk, the system let you know about it, and it was not happy. At 720p lowest settings with a 5 chunk render distance, we saw average frame rates of 59 with 29 and 15 1% and 0.1% lows respectively. Another game that didn't run well was Doom the Dark Ages. Ah yes, another limitation of older hardware. The newest Doom is an Unreal Engine 5 game that requires hardware ray tracing and a GPU with 8 gigabytes of VRAM. The second AAA title this year alone with those requirements. Yikes. Well, if you can't run the game at least, you can say you didn't run it poorly. 
the same way I never got to be in law school. But back to games that ran fine. At 1080p lowest settings, the 2400 GE maintained an average of 44 FPS with 32 1% lows and 21.1% lows. I wouldn't say it's the best experience I ever had in Rocket League, but it was honestly a pretty smooth one. I could play the game like this for hours with the frame counter off and I think I'd quickly adjust and start to enjoy the game, even if it is a bit blurry. For GTA, don't even bother with the Enhanced Edition. Save that for the people who have money pouring out of their as rock motherboards. At least our 2400 GE isn't a budding pyromaniac. I landed on 1080p lowest settings with a 75% resolution scale for Rockstar's legacy title. The experience was... lively. Honestly, if you wanted to load in and don't mind the textures or lack thereof, I played for about 30 minutes through the first opening missions and it went off without much fuss. Or fidelity. Averaging out the benchmarks, we saw the 2400 GE average a respectable 46 FPS. It's over the 30 FPS I was accustomed to being a console gamer for so long. Less respectable are the 1% and 0.1% lows of 33 and 15, representing an overall uneven experience. For $100, you'd be best off playing older AAAs, esports, and indie games. But that still leaves you with thousands of options. Looking at this through the lens of value, our $100 gaming PC has a pretty decent cost per frame. For every frame generated, it costs us $2.31. Not bad. For reference, if you spent $500 and averaged 200 FPS, that would still cost you $2.50 per frame. But looking at the system more holistically, it was perfectly fine for everyday use, and that's the main benefit of a system like this. When you're not gaming, you still have a fully functioning PC that you can use for schoolwork, or office work, or general browsing. And with so many programs being hosted on the cloud, you can even 3D model on a site like Tinkercad. Potatoes have come a long way. So now, the big question. Would I recommend this? Honestly, yes. There are ways to assemble something that performs better today. I don't disagree. There are even, if you are lucky, old HP pavilions with Ryzen's in them for not much more money. I should know. I had one. But those pavilions and many other office PCs have one small problem. They're on dead-end platforms. I don't mean that the Ryzen 5 2600 found in many of them are the last CPUs on AM4, but that OEMs like HP don't provide BIOS updates that allow newer CPUs to run in them despite the socket physically supporting it. The PC we put together does. So when your birthday or the next holiday comes around and you have 200 to 250 to put in your system, that can get you a long way. For just 250, you could put in an RX 6600 for about 150, a 512 gigabyte SSD for about 30, a new case and power supply, call it 60, and if it's in the budget, a matching 8 gigabyte stick of RAM would be nice for around 10 bucks. That puts us at $255 for the upgrades and a total cost of $363 for a PC that can play everything. And if you're thrifty and search your local marketplace for good deals, I know you could do it for even less than that. I've done it time and time again. But if you're interested in seeing me put together an upgraded version of this build for around the $350 mark, let me know down in the comments. If you made it to the end of the video, chances are you enjoyed it. If that was the case, please like and subscribe so I can continue to bring you content like this. Your support is greatly appreciated and I have pages and pages of future videos I would love to bring to fruition. Thanks again for watching and until next time, stay lucky.